Jones. This is kind of a recruiting meeting, something that will help you guys out. Um, my goal is to have this basically every year. Um, we had one last year. It wasn't as in-depth as this year's is going to be, so I'm hoping that we can make it as easy moving forward as possible for you guys. Um, brought in a few guys to help talk about it from different angles, not only from the head coach's side, but from a parent's perspective too, because I know that's what you guys are looking for. So this part is the first hour is going to be roughly around the, the recruiting process for your kids. And we're going to go more into the 316 side afterwards. Okay. Um, the packets that you got, you can kind of put to the side. We'll go through that for the parent or for the parent meeting after the recruiting meeting. So um, to kind of help you guys out a little bit. Okay. Here's what's kind of going to be covered. Okay. What can a player do to, be get, to get recruited? What can you guys do to get recruited? Um, what does 316 do to help you guys out in your recruiting process? Um, what is timetable for getting signed or talked to or whatever, anything with communication with college? Um, what can a parent do to help out their kid get recruited? I know that's a big question that you guys have asked. We're gonna try to cover it as best we can. Um, and then how do I know if a college is interested or not? Okay, these are all things that we're going to kind of cover throughout this whole time. Obviously, there's going to be some more. Um, fall baseball, this is always a good recruiting tool. Um, we're going to go through specific colleges. We're going to play at those colleges in front of those coaches. Um, the schedule, the entire schedule is going to be sent out this week, so be ready for it. But as of right now, we're going to start off on the first. I know it's Labor Day weekend. That's kind of like a scrimmage or practice to get us ready. That's something that we didn't do last year. We took the whole Labor Day weekend off. But I don't want you guys jumping right into a Barton Hutch scrimmage without any practice going on. So if you can be there, that's great. If you can, it's not a big deal. Um, the, all, the, all this information will be sent out to you guys as soon as possible. I've got the 29th and the 14th. One of those two days, we're going to actually do recruiting videos for your kids. Um, we're going to go there. We're going to film. We're going to put them all together. Um, whatever you can do, and then send your kid a recruiting video so that then you can send it to college. Okay? So that's something that we're going to do on one of those two dates. <laughs> All right? Like I said, full schedule, calendar will be emailed to you as soon as we get to it. I, basically what I did over the last couple weeks is I called up the colleges and coaches and kind of told them, give me a little, little blurb about you know, the recruiting process and different things. So these are all quotes right from the college coaches themselves. So Phil Stevenson, he says, I prefer info for players or coaches than an email from parents. Coaches' recommendations mean the most to me because they're putting their name on the line. Okay? So when we send your kids somewhere, our name's on the line. Okay? We don't try to oversell your kids, and I think all the coaches are huge on that. Okay? We're going to put you in the best spot for your son to succeed. I'm always trying to include video if possible. Also give us time to respond as we receive several emails daily. If you haven't heard back in a couple weeks, send another one. First one might have slipped through without getting seen. This is from Coach Biggs. Biggest thing I would say is to be patient. Everyone is in such a big hurry and panics if they don't already have offers. And you kind of see that. The recruiting process goes, I mean, we were still recruiting in 2018 in the summer. Okay, so it's a long process. It just kind of depends on where they have needs. Um, we don't offer until visits. We've had a few guys in, but still have a lot to contact. We were still on the road all summer recruiting, or we were on the road all summer recruiting, and things get really hectic. Now I'm going to put this, I'm going to email this out to you guys so you can read them as well, OK? Um, Chris Bill, Allen County Community College. If a school recruits you, always know that they um, know what they have returning. Look at the roster. So if, they are recruiting into deep positions. You're not going to be stuck behind people, OK? You've got to know what you want. Do I want to go there and play right away? Do I want to play at a JUCO? Do I want to play at a four-year? Okay? Sometimes at a four-year, they'll go right into it, and they will redshirt you possibly. These are things that you need to start thinking about. Does that make sense? Looking at colleges that fit you as a player, not just the college that you said, oh, they have interest in me, I'm going to go there. You want to get in the best fit for you. Hey, don't ask about baseball scholarships drives us crazy. Coaches already have their minds made up whether they're going to offer you or not. And with the academic policies in Kansas, sometimes academic money is more than baseball scholarships. Okay? Academics, guys. 
ACT, there's three things a college coach tells me. Number one, how are they as a player? And I hope that since you're on 316 Elite, we've got that covered, okay? Number two, what's their ACT score? What's their GPA? Those are the three things I get asked all the time, okay? So hopefully you have those two covered in the classroom. Um, lastly, don't judge a school by wins and losses. Sometimes coaches develop players by allowing them to fail, and that can result in more losses rather than playing the same 10 all the time. Coach Schmitty um, from Hutch, they have to find what's right for them. He said, number one, you got to find the best academic fit. Okay. Number two, playing time fit. Number three, the coaching, coaching staff. And number four, the philosophy of the college. Okay. Those are four things that he says that you really need to look at in that order. Um, communicate your interest in school. This is something that I really like. Okay, if you are very interested in them and they're interested in you, go to their camps. Go to their fall games. Make yourself presentable. Take some time out and go to a fall game. Okay? Or go to some of their spring games early. Okay? Go introduce yourself to the coach. Um, find out what they need in your position. Um, coach Reller for Pratt, the biggest role for parents, in my opinion, is helping their kid be organized during this process. Most kids and parents come to campus pretty clueless if it is their first visit. They need to be prepared. If they seem prepared, the college coaches will feel like they are very interested in that school, which will make them more um, marketable for their team. Okay? Kids and parents need to have important questions to ask. Okay? Parents, go with your kids to these visits. Don't feel like you are a nuisance. Don't be afraid to ask questions, parents. Just as much right on the line for you as your player. Okay? Don't be afraid to ask. If you have questions, it cuts through all the all the stuff, and we'll get to a quote later that you'll laugh at. Um, know what's important to them when choosing a school. Make sure that you have some background on the school. If you show up and you're like, "Well, coach, we know that you have this, this, and this, and this is what our kid wants to study," automatically it shows the coach that you're interested, extremely interested. Okay, they're gonna want to jump on you real quick. All right. Um, coach Murray, emails mean more coming from a coach. Okay. Videos need to be included, and parents need to go with their kids on the visit so they can cut through all the bullshit. That's a solid quote from Coach Murray right there. Okay? Coach Meyer, and this I just got, and it was five pages long, but I cut it down for you guys. Don't panic if the process doesn't start for your kid once they're eligible for recruitment. Only high-level D1 and D2 start recruiting after the sophomore year, even junior year. Okay? Majority of all other schools start the comp completion of the prospective student athletes junior year. So after the junior year is when they really start heavily recruiting. Okay? Email coaches. I, I can't see every kid in the area. I will recruit you if I know you're interested. Send video. As you can see, a lot on video, right? That's what we need to do is 316. Um, have attention to detail. I know kids send me generic emails that go out to hundreds of coach coaches. Make it personal. So if you're the person that writes a generic email and sends it out to a hundred coaches, it doesn't mean as much than a personal email going out to one coach. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, so before we get into Coach Frady, who's a Southwestern College coach, um, very good friend of ours, um, Coach Frady has a background that I'm gonna let him explain. From the 316 side of things, guys, we field phone calls all the time. You're constantly talking to coaches, okay? It's already started. It started, actually, I started calling coaches and talking to them probably two and a half months ago, about this season, okay? Now, that was prior to, obviously, in the fall when we talked about them as well. So we, we, we constantly communicate with them, okay? What we're going to do is send out something. I want to get your kids' interests or what their school or what they want and all these questions that were asked. So you're going to be sent that email this week. Okay? Have your kids sit down, answer it on the player form. That way it can give us a guide to is where to push them towards. Does that make sense to everybody? Also, we're going to make your kid a recruiting video. We're going to do that this year. Okay? Some of you already have. I know some Mesa South parents already have something. Um, if I were you guys personally, if you have any game film, it could be um, baseball game film. It could even be football game film. Okay? Show that your kid's an athlete. It could be basketball game filming if you want. Okay, show me you're an athlete because we'll put that all in the recruiting <coughs> video with the kid. Does that make sense to everybody? And we do our best to make these recruiting videos look really good. They'll have uh, MP4 of it and they can send it to as many colleges as they want. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? Yeah? 
Okay. Coach Freddy, stage is yours, my friend. Yes, Coach sir. Freddy, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. As Ryan said, one thing I want to hit on that video, parents, the one thing that helps us out a lot is if you get up close, if you're sitting back in the top row of the, in the nosebleed section of the stands and you're shooting through a chain link fence, and there's about 40 feet of distance and he looks like an ant there. We can only zoom it in so much. And then it's from straight behind. So I like to get the side angle. So if it's right hand hitter, get down that first baseline and get something clear of him. If it's left hand hitter, third baseline. We can't really tell much about the dynamic of the swing or the mechanics of the swing from straight behind or obscured from, you know, straight behind home plate and even maybe to his hitting side. Okay, so make sure we're getting clean footage of it. As, uh, as Coach Jones said, my name is Kevin Frady. I'm from Southwestern College, uh, just down in Linfield, Kansas. We just had our first year this last year in 68 years. So we're a new NAI program that competes in the KCAC Conference. I, I do have a 316 player. One of the, we played 316 last year. Uh, here, Mark Colton Richardson is a, is a young catcher that I really like uh, just because of the intangibles. And he does have some ability, but he plays like E6-5 rather than 5-6. And I, I really like that. I like the, the, just the temperament he has about the game and the intensity which, which he plays with. From a catch, I didn't, really wasn't caring too much about the, the offensive side because he's a catcher. Defense is first a catcher. So I loved him and, and great family. Um, come, came from a great organization. So I knew it was a lock for us um, that that was a guy that we wanted out, out you know, in our first recruiting class um, coming in after our first year, I'm sorry. So in our first year in the KCAC Conference, we were picked to finish 10th out of 11 teams, which I probably would have put us the same place. Um, well, my guys didn't like it too much, nor did I. I took it as, you know, I kind of took it personally and we finished fourth uh, in the conference. I had a winning record. And I think that was just the beginning of things to come. The, the baseball in the KCAC conference, everyone thinks they gotta go the division one route because it's sexy. I get it, it is. I, I was at the University of Kansas. I'm you know, coached with Coach Price for five years there on his staff and it is sexy. I mean, it's kids, I mean, guys, it's, it's great, but are you gonna go there and are you actually gonna play and are you gonna contribute? So, and that's gonna be some, kind of something I'm gonna get into. I've coached at the Division II level at both uh, West Texas A&M and Maryville University out in St. Louis. I've coached, obviously, at the Division I level. I've coached at the junior college level in Arizona and Washington and at the NAI level. And I've also been a professional scout covering the Four Corner region for the New York Mets. Uh, one of my guys that I signed, uh, Jeff Duncan out of Arizona State, is now the head coach at Kent State University. Uh, so I had a big leader on my, on my credit for the short time I did scouting, and that's what how scouts kind of, how many feathers you got in your cap is, is a good thing. Tells you what type of scout you were. Oh, first thing that Brian asked me to get into was the recruiting time frame. And it's, it just seems to be getting earlier and earlier nowadays. Um, when you're seeing kids that are 2022 20, or 2022 20, grads committing to Texas Christian or Arizona State, I'm just sitting there shaking my head. It, it's, to me, it's horrible. And what you guys got to understand is, yes, they're going to commit to you guys, but what if something happens? How committed are they really? And that's what you guys got to kind of ask yourself. Because something might happen here, something might happen with the, the, the knee. Anything can happen. Tomorrow's never guaranteed. So be leery of those early commitments and what they mean. I mean, I know it's kids love putting that stuff on Instagram and Twitter, but to me it's overrated and it's really kind of creating some bad things for the games because you're hearing about kids committing their freshman year in high school. I ran into a kid this last year at Murray State Junior College in Oklahoma, and his dad was all you know upset because he wasn't his kid wasn't a Sooner. Well, kid recruits or commits to one class or one coaching staff, and then that coaching staff gets removed. The new coaching staff they don't know that kid anything, and so they didn't honor his scholarship. He had to go to junior college. That happens all the time. So just be, don't rush into it so much. It is a recruiting time frames for, it is different at each level. You know, the division ones have rules that are different from the division two. The division three have rules that are diff different from division three or division two and division one. 
our rules are completely different. Really, it's kind of, we don't have any rules uh, in the NAI. We do to an extent, but, uh, and then there's the junior college that they really don't have many rules. Um, we have our, there's our limitations and stuff like that at the NAI, but from a recruiting standpoint, we can go out and we don't have dead periods like they do in the NCAA. Uh, we don't have the certain quiet periods that they do in the NCAA. We can contact a kid after his freshman year if we'd like, um, you know, and talk to him as a coaching staff where they can't really do that uh, at the Division One level. Um, you know, when you're in high school, every year, every game is important to me. In, in a nutshell, to me, the earlier you get going on this process and start formulating your list is going to be key for you guys. Okay. Um, but bottom line, though, too, is it's all about timing. Player A may really want to be a Jayhawk, okay? But does Coach Price need Player A on his, you know, on his team because of what he has returning? And is Player A better than what he has on his roster? I tell my guys every year, my job as a head coach is to go out and recruit better every year. Your job is either to rise up and accept that competition or fall to it. It's, your cho it's their choice. So that's what we're doing, you know, from a coaching standpoint. From a, um, the other aspect that uh, Ryan wanted me to talk about was what can players do to help themselves? And a couple of coaches said it up there. I have on here, first and foremost, excel in the classroom and test high. When I call on guys, I'm asking them, what's his GPA? What's his SAT or ACT? Because then right away I'm formulating how much academic money I can give them. Because if I can save money on the baseball side, I want to save money on the baseball side. Basically, everybody at our at our place is getting a piece of the pie. We don't have the limits. At Division one is limit seven. Division two is nine. We don't have those types of limits. We we base our recruiting at the NAI level off of averages. So I can give more. I can stack academic and athletic. I can also take money from outside donors and that make a donation to our program. We just had a gentleman in who I've known for 15 years because he's the number two booster up at KU. Um, he wrote $20,000 in supplemental checks uh, for our guys for to add to their scholarship. So having guys like that is a huge, huge help to build what he feels that, that I'm capable of building there for him. Um, I think what players can do, another thing is, you gotta be honest with yourselves and your abilities, okay? I think a lot of the times you see this kid going there and that kid going over here, but what can you do? And, that, and that's the thing, I talk to my guys all the time about it, you gotta be honest with yourself. If you're not being, being honest with yourself, you're, you're fooling yourself, you're never gonna be able to take that next step. And it's when, with being honest with yourself, you're gonna be able to identify what you need to work on, what you don't need to work on, and have a much clearer path to becoming the baseball player that you wanna be. Um, so next thing I have on here as a player, don't be enamored with stats. Um, yes, they help, but kids get lost in them and forget how to compete. I cannot begin to tell you when I'm out of games, I just see kids not competing. And I don't care if you're hitting 350, if when the game's on the line and you don't compete, I'm going on to the next guy. I'd rather take a 250 hitter that when the game's on the line, you can tell the difference in him and he's up there competing and he's giving it all he's got. The game is hard and we want guys that, hey, they'll face that thing head on. It's like I said about Colton Richardson, 5'6", but he plays like he's 6'5", okay? Um, constantly work to improve your skill sets. Do not fear change and do not overlook weaknesses. Address them with intent. You want to be well-rounded. I think a lot of kids, uh, yeah, hey, I'm not good at my backhand side, so I'm just gonna kind of cheat over here. It's gonna get exposed at some point, so work on that backhand side, break things down. I'm not good at bunting, so I'm not gonna bunt, or I'm just gonna be so bad at bunting, the coach won't give me the bunt sign. You know, I'll, I told kids, if you, I tell my guys all the time, if we can't bunt, then I'm gonna find a guy that can, and I'm gonna play him, because it's just the little things. And that's what you guys got to understand. The little things add up to the big things in baseball. Okay. Um, do not be afraid to play other sports. Coaches and scouts learn a lot about your makeup character uh, when they see you competing in other activities. I think that's key. At KU, 
We had uh, the second all-time winningest wrestler in Iowa State history starting in left field for us in 2009, Jimmy Waters. Our pitching coach, Ryan Graves, was scared as hell of him because he was about 165. He, fought, he wrestled in a 165-pound weight class, and uh, he saw, we saw some video of him, and this guy was tenacious. Played about 180 for us at KU, but he was a tremendous Jayhawk for us. Um, our right fielder that year was Casey Lytle, who was a three-sport athlete out of Chaparral High School in Scottsdale, Arizona. I think the more you focus on becoming specialized, you reach your ceiling quicker. As a scout, you know, I was, I was told, hey, we're, we're projecting the high school guys and we're basing our, our evaluations off our performance of the college guys. So there's that, there's that difference. But once you reach that ceiling by specializing in it, where are you gonna go? And that's the tough thing. Okay. Um, you can still be a good college. I'm not saying you can't be a good college player, but you just, I think you, you give yourself more room to develop and you kind of sometimes shorten your baseball lifespan by doing that, okay? Um, learn how to handle failure. That's the biggest thing, guys. How they handle failure will determine uh, your frequency of success, okay? To me, I've never seen, if I have a guy, we've got a body language rule this year. And if a guy shows any negativity towards his teammates, if he's showing, if he slams a bat, slams a helmet, yells a big old F-bomb because, you know, this or that, gives the umpire a cross look because he didn't agree with the call, whatever, we are, or just pouting, you know, slouching, moping around, not being a good teammate, I'm gonna send him home from practice because I'm not gonna let that attitude infect our team and what we can do this year. And then it's gonna be their responsibility to come to me the next day and tell me how they're gonna prevent that from happening again. And if I believe it, then I'll let them come out and practice again. But if they do not come and meet me, they're not allowed to come out and practice until they address it. So I wanna teach them how to handle failure. Not many jobs in America can you fail 70% of the time and still get paid millions and millions of dollars. How you handle failure is gonna be the key, but I'm just, you know, with the kids not getting it their way, the way they want it, and seeing the bad body language, hey, I want them. I want to teach my guys how to handle adversity in a much more professional uh, manner, and that's what we're trying to get to with them. Because life is hard. They're going to get knocked down, and they got to understand how to pick themselves back up. This next one, and it gets me. It is. I'm old school. I I am a tech. I, I you know I don't want to even say the word. I'm illiterate when it comes to tech or technology stuff, okay? I think the kids need to learn how to communicate better, face-to-face. -face. I'll call a recruit or I'll call one of even my own guys and they won't answer. But I'm kidding you not, once I hang up or once I leave, hey coach, what do you need? Through a text. Well, I needed to talk to you, that's why I called you. <laughs> I don't need this. And I think that's, that's becoming more and more uh, the norm with the kids nowadays. They'll text quicker than they'll talk to you. And you got to be able to have that, you know, that one to one interaction. One of the things we do is I meet with each guy individually five to ten minutes, probably every other week. And I just want to see where they're at with things. Just, just talk to them. Talk to them about their girlfriend, talk to them about family, how class they're going, whatever. I just want to know where they're at and be able to communicate with them joke with them, talk to them, whatever. Um, the next thing is, I think you guys gotta look for schools outside of your comfort zone, okay? And what I mean by that is, we're all Kansas guys, you guys are all Kansas kids here, you got Wichita State, Kansas, and Kansas State, okay? I'm gonna go D1, that's where we're, we're looking towards. Their job is, at those three schools is to go out and get the best fit for them, depending on the timing, that's gonna help them get to where they wanna get to, which is hopefully Omaha, okay? You may not be on that list, but that doesn't mean you couldn't go to a school here, you know, in Missouri or Colorado, Texas, wherever. Open, open up your, uh, your options some more, because it, to me, it's a great opportunity. We got kids, Winfield, Kansas. Y'all know where Winfield, Kansas is, because you guys will come down there and play us again this year, October 6th. Uh, you guys are coming down. 
we got kids from 16 different states on our roster. Okay, we got 43 guys on our roster right now. I got a uh, kid from Japan. So, and we've got seven kids from Arizona. One of the things I sell in my recruiting uh, talk with them is get out of your bubble. Go and compete against other kids from different parts of the country so you get a truer measurement of who you are and where you are as a baseball player. I think that's key for your guys' growth. Okay? Um, as one of the coaches said up here, I had on here, pick out 10 to 15 schools that are on your list. Don't, you don't have to make them all. Keep one. One thing, when I was coaching junior college in Arizona, I made guys give me a list of five to 10 schools at Division I, Division II, Division and NEI level. And I would call them, I would be realistic with them, okay? Um, but you gotta study their roster, see what their needs are, okay? And, and just kind of go that route with everything. The other thing, guys, and this is the key thing, okay, for players. You never know who's watching, okay? In the, sun, in the spring of 17, I got hired from West Texas A&M to Southwestern. My first, <clears throat> excuse me, my first day on campus was December 5th, 2016. That spring, I was out on the road recruiting. I was spending, I spent a week in Arizona, 10 days in Texas. I spent uh, about eight days in Oklahoma. I was out in Illinois, I was out in Washington, California, and boom, all of a sudden my phone rings. It's John Sheff, the head coach at University of Maryland, who he and I coach together at KU. Okay, and he says, Frades, I know you've been seeing a lot of guys this year, I need a shortstop. And I said, oh, okay, well, you really need to go and look at this kid at Colorado Northwestern. He's a British Columbia kid. He's hitting 350, the team averages 220s and counting for over. 50% of the team's offense, and his name's Taylor Wright. And he said, then he called me back. He said, I have to talk to the coach. He said, he plays too shallow. I said, then move him back, John. You know, I mean, it's not that hard. <laughs> so, and he just kind of laughed. He said, I guess you're right, but you like him. And I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, what other guys? I said, Taylor Needham at, at Edmonds Community College, switch hitter with some juice. He was the Ken Wax player of the year. Then I said, uh, there was one other kid that I talked about with them. And then sure enough, after that phone call, Coach Price comes to me, hey, one run. That's what he loves to call me. You know, when you talk to Coach Price, he's gonna call you either big time money or stud. I'm the only person outside of that creating that he calls one run because one summer I coached in 33 one run games and I have 15 and 18 record in them. He thought that was hilarious. So he calls me one run still to this day. Um, but he says, I need a shortstop. Well, he flew in, Taylor Wright as well. He threw, flew in Zach Needham. Zach Needham ended up going to uh, Zach Needham ended up going to University of Houston. Taylor Wright ended up signing with Chef at Maryland. We talk all the time with scouts, with other coaches, because we can't be everywhere we need to be when we need to be there. So we get on the horn, and, and we just utilize our network, and I think that's key. So that time when you aren't hustling down the line, busting a hard 90, or you are just Cadillacing it around first on your turn, or you kind of just ole a ball, be careful who might be in those stands, okay? Because as a scout too, I remember scouting a game, very, I, I still remember this vividly guys, I was scouting a game at South Mountain Community College, and on the field was, uh, they had Timmy Hew uh, Jeff Jeff Hewson, which was Tim Hewson's nephew, big leaguer. They had Scott Harrison at second base, played in the big leagues. Ian Kinsler was at shortstop for Central, and then they had another guy that got big league time at shortstop or at third base, and hitter for South Mountain who was Michael Collins. I think he may have gotten up to double A with Mariners, but he hit a fly ball in the outfield runner on first base. Kinsler saw it, it was hit to the second baseman. Kinsler saw the hitter just drop it back Collins and he was going back towards the dugout. That wasn't playing the game. And he's yelling, drop it, drop it, drop it. It was the only ball I saw Harrison field cleanly in the infield. But sure enough, it bounced up, hit his glove, he went there and across. You know, and back then they didn't have that rule, I guess. Or maybe the umpire just Knew it was Scott Harrison and didn't bang him because of the rule of uh, 
purposely dropped it. <coughs> but Collins, right then and there, I'm not going to put my name on that kid. I crossed him off my list and moved on to the next guy. That's how that's how it done. I mean, Lincoln holds calm. The guy that set the ball down. John Stratton at Arizona Western came out to replace his pitcher before John's even crossed the line. You get him, Lincoln, who is a 95, 97, 6'4", 215, 220-pound arm out of Arizona Western. He puts the ball on the mound and walks off the field before John even gets across the line. Well, right there, I'm not going to put my name on that guy. Okay, it's the little things that you guys do that we're we're always watching. And as a scout down in Arizona, you always know who the scouts are because they got the you know the untucked shirts, short sleeve floral shirts, the khaki pants, stock watch cord hanging out, book hanging out of their back pocket. I didn't like to look like every scout. I wanted to see what you're doing. I wasn't I didn't even I stopped taking a gun in to my games because I'd see too many kids pitch to that radar gun. Okay? And then it would elevate and flatten out. And then they would get hit. And then I'm saying, well the kid can't miss a barrel. I want to see pitchability. I want to see what you can do when you don't have your best stuff because you're not going to have your best stuff every day. So right. and if I needed a velocity, I could get it. But I didn't want that kid to know I was there to watch him. And if I really needed it, the very last minute, I'd pull up my gun if there were no other guns there. It's just it's things you got to do, okay? Um, so now, on to the other thing. Parents, what can you do to help your sons? Now, I'm not saying it's this group. I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for this, this organization. In fact, if my wife and our son were here, they live on the it's east of St. Louis um, in Illinois. If they were here, our son would be part of the 316, our 316 organization. Okay, we would make sure he got up every day or whenever he needed to from Winfield. Because um, that's how much respect I have for Ray and, and the coaches uh, and Jonesy. So, a lot of times, parents, it's not the kid or anything the kid does, it's, it's what you guys do. That sometimes hurts the kids. So we gotta be careful as parents too, not to hurt our kids. Full rides, there are, you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many, hey, I, I want my kidneys to have full ride. <laughs> They're non-existent, they aren't there. There is going to have to be some dead incurred if you want to get a you know, degree and play baseball. It's not like football where they got 85 scholarships. It's not like you know Division One basketball where they got more suits than guys in uniforms on the bench. Okay? It, baseball's not a revenue sport, so they, they have it at 11-7. Division Two. some schools might. Now, we did have at, at West Texas A&M, the way we set up our scholarships, being at nine, we devoted six straight up to pitching. So we would give two guys full rides, and that was our Friday and Saturday guy. We were able to do that easier at the Division II level than you can at the Division I level. Because Division II in West Texas, you're JC based with your recruiting, so you know they're going to be rotating out of there or you're getting Division I kickbacks. Okay? Um, the other thing, parents, we watch you guys just as much, if not more, than we watch the players. I want to see how you guys are reacting to what your kids are doing on the field and what that dynamic of that relationship is. Because I've seen some ugly, ugly things in my travels. Okay? And the one thing, as I said about the coaches network, we talk about the parents as well. I've passed on kids because I've been warned, hey, his dad, oof, you know, watch out. I said, okay, I, I don't I don't need that headache. I don't get paid enough to deal with that as well. Um, so I think, uh, and that's, again, that's something I hear every year. I see it at the junior college level too. I'm sure, you know, Gary's seen it with dealing with Dalton. Um, I think parents too, you know, one of the things I have on here is just understand that it takes courage to play this game. Competing a game, that is based on failure all while battling the fear all of us have, and that is the fear of failure. Build them up, and please do not let them take it personal. Kids, it's a performance, it's not you as a person. I have kids all the time that take an over four day personally. It's just a bad performance that day, you know? I mean, 
Last time I checked, Manny Machado has an open four day every now and again. You know, it happens. That kind of goes back to how you deal with the failure. Okay. Um, I think another thing you know that's important uh, is that I have down here is just like the players, you guys need to be honest about your child's ability and skill sets. Part of the key to that is surrounding yourself and putting yourself in touch with people that can be trusted and in touch with organizations such as this that can be trusted and give you honest feedback. Okay? Don't take that word or don't let that word of that, that one outfit dangling that carrot as it was, was mentioned to me earlier, saying, oh, hey, we're going to get your kid drafted or we're going to do this for your kid. Hogwash. That's not going to happen. And for people that have been involved in the draft or a draft, they know how to talk about it. It's a crapshoot. You have group one guys, group two guys, group three guys, group four guys, group five guys. There's no group four or five guys getting drafted. Okay? Where scouts make their money are on the group three guys, group one guys, those are your first round guys. But if you got 100 in, you know, in the country and there's only 30 picks, well, you know, they're going to fall down and it's just going to. Well, he was told he was going to be a second rounder, and he was a 15th or an 18th rounder. That cost him, you know, you know, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars, whatever it may be. It's a, it's a crapshoot. So don't let these organizations tell you things that they know nothing about. Okay. Um, I think a big thing is is one thing I've done with with our our son Will, and, and my wife is key on it for continuing it. Teach them how to stand up and handle their own business. That's one thing you guys can do to help them. Instead of getting involved yourselves and calling the coach when the kid's not playing, talk to your talk to your kid. Give the kid a plan. Teach him how to communicate and handle his own business. I think that's probably one of the biggest. I'm not trying to tell anybody here how to be a parent, but from what I've seen, I get sometimes I get more calls or questions about a kid's playing time from the parents than I do the actual player themselves. Okay. Um, just some extra things I had down here to wrap this up. I think, you know, using a quote that, that Frosty Westring, and I know being a Northwest guy, none of you guys know who Frosty Westring is, but he was a legendary football coach at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Won a couple of national championships there. He said, the big time's what you make for where you're at. When I heard that back in high school, I said, man, that just stuck with me. Big time's what you make of where you're at. You can go, guys, you can go and be the big fish in a small pond and still get the same looks because the scout's job is to find you if you have the playable skill sets that they covet no matter where you play. They'll say, oh, it's the competition. No, I don't care. If your bat speed's better than that guy at Wichita State, if you're faster than that guy at Wichita State, if you can throw harder than that guy at KU, I don't care if that we're in the NAI. And having a good relationship with scouts, I think I can help our guys with regards to that. But the big time is what you make where you're at. You can make that that Southwestern or that Cave or your Wichita State or your KU. Okay? But go and be the big fish in a small pond where you're going to excel and succeed, and you can walk out. There, it's still competitive baseball. Um, the other thing is, guys, this is more direct, more towards the players. I always ask my guys, are you a baseball player or are you a kid that plays baseball? And I say to them, if you have to ask yourself if you're a kid that plays baseball, that doesn't mean you can't become a baseball player. I like baseball players. Baseball players are yard rats. They're in there constantly seeking to get into the cages. They want the early work. They want the late work. They want it all they can get. Okay. Baseball players, you can tell the difference in the baseball player versus a kid that plays baseball. And the baseball guys know what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, then I, you know, with all this analytics stuff that's going on out there with the OPS, the war, you know, all that stuff, I just got two new ones that, that, I, that I like, CHP and DHC. Can he play and does he compete? I don't care about stats. I want to know those two things. Can he play the game and does he compete? Because everything else, mechanics aside, I just told my young assistant today, I said, you're making too many tweaks with our hitters right now. I, don't, I want you to stop. Right now, the process is we're going to focus on plan, approach, pitch recognition, intent, purpose, and focus. He says, we're not going to do anything with mechanics. I said, what the hell do mechanics matter if we don't have those six things? It doesn't matter for anything. Amen. You can have the prettiest swing in America, guys, but if you don't know your strike zone,
you don't know your points of contact, what does the pretty swing matter? Understand how the game works, trust the process with everything. As far as freaking out about not signing early, guys, I'm still actively recruiting. We start school on Monday. I'm still trying to find a couple of guys to get in if I can. So don't panic on that one, all right? Again, it's about timing and be understanding with that. But don't give up on your dream. There is a place out there for everybody, regardless. Junior college, NAI, D3, D2, D1. At the NAI, we are, I, I don't like recruiting at-risk kids academically because it's a lot of extra work for me, okay? But the NAI, the purpose of the NAI is they recruit athletes that get to be students. We're at the NCAA, they're recruiting students that get to be athletes, okay? To me, I'm still going after the 3 GPA guys, although I was incredibly proud of, you know, a couple of our guys. Last year, one kid, Austin Brown, he came in with a 1.8 GPA out of Phoenix College in Arizona. Junior college didn't have a gun. Okay, got a 3.7, and then he got he followed that 3.7 up with a 3.5. And I was incredibly proud of him. And you know, I told him that. You know, Tyler Gibbons had never gotten a 3.0 GPA before in college. He got a 3.3 his first semester. Kind of slacked in the second semester because it's baseball season. We're on we're on the go a lot. He got a 2.9. So I'll get, you know, I'll take that. I'm still wanting those guys. It took me 23 years to get my degree, as I told I tell Coach Price all the time, you know, he surrounds himself with overachievers. I said, hey, you can keep me on that list. He says, why is that? I said, because I got my degree done in 23 years and not 24. <laughs> and uh, so he just goes, hey, big time, that's why you're the best. But uh, it, again, guys, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. We play you guys at the sixth down there in Winfield. If you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me or my, one of my coaches. We'll talk to you. I'm sure we might end up recruiting some of you guys because this is an organization I'd really like us to get tied into because they're doing the right things with their guys. Okay? I appreciate your time very much. Um, we'll kind of have a little question session at the end. Um, it won't be too long, so we can jump into the other stuff. But now I want to give you the parent perspective. Um, Mr. Dinkle, Mr. Terry Dinkle coming up here in a second. He has, he's not only a high school baseball coach, we've got it right now, a lot of you guys know him. He has a son named Dalton. Now, he went through a lot of stuff with Dalton, okay? So Dalton played at Cali, so he's been recruited from the JUCO level, and now recently he signed with Louisiana Tech. So. I'm um, really, really excited. He he called me up and said, please, if you have any type of recruiting meeting, please let me speak in it because I have a parent's perspective that everybody needs to hear. So thank you so much for coming out here, Carrie. I'm leaving the floor to you, my friend. Hey guys, uh, first of all, I want to start with Coach Randy. Uh, Coach Randy, when, when did I first meet you? Never did. Never did. Today. <laughs> Coach Randy was at or one of his staff members was at every Cali County baseball game, either on the road or all around. I never talked to the guy once. I knew who he was. I knew who his staff was. I knew who all the guys that were out, out of the field, but I didn't talk to him. The reason why is because us as parents, that's not our job. It's, it's the kid's job to talk about how they play. So today when I walked in, we introduced each other, to each other. That was it. That's the first time I've seen this guy all over the place and he's out there and he's watching and there's schools watching so what he said about you know coaches there's always someone watching is, is absolutely the truth so parents what i what i want to talk to you about is my son um, is is going to be a junior at louisiana tech this year his, his first year there and uh, for the last two years he played at county county county, county is a perennial powerhouse they're, they're always good uh, and it's not easy playing for those guys down there and if, if, if you're going to go and your kids are going to go play at a place that is is hard-nosed they will figure out if they love baseball or if they don't love baseball and if they want to go on now as a parent I had to learn the hardest thing ever was after every game when we were in Little League and we were playing travel ball and going all over the country, 
I would always be in his ass all the time. Why'd you do this? Why didn't you do that? You know, I'm always hard on him. And, and it strained our relationship. It was tough. Mom always said when we left West Urban, you have till 21st Street. That's it. Mom would drive her own car. I would, he would go with mom and not drive home with me. So that was hard as a parent. And then finally one day I had a guy tell me, he goes, you know what? After every game, tell your kid that you enjoy watching him play. And I did that his first collegiate baseball game. And from then on, he, he <coughs> moved up and got better at baseball. It was amazing. What by me as a parent telling him that I enjoyed watching him play. And that was the best thing I ever did for me, my wife, and for my son. So, and I know all you guys, parents, you want your kid to be the best guy out there and you want them to go hard, but you know what? Enjoy the ride because it is, it's quick and it can end in a split second. I was pretty lucky. Dalton was a, uh, um, a high school, he was an all-state catcher for two years in a row. Um, pretty good player. He was recruited by three Division Ones. All three Division Ones offered him a preferred walk-on. He's a Kansas kid. So as a parent, I'm sitting there going, why is that? Why is it called a preferred walk-on? Why don't local schools, local Division Ones, give money to Kansas kids? They don't. So if you think you're gonna go play Division One in Kansas, it's a preferred walk-on. That's how it works. 11.7 scholarships, it's tough to get. It's